Hello everyone, I am Veos and welcome back to another video. We're going to take a quick break from the outpost mining ship and do a little something easy and quick and fun. So I was thinking of making a basic tutorial. Now a lot of you out there who have played this game for a very long time already know everything I'm about to teach you. Wait a minute, well I can't teach you if you already know. This is going to be a tutorial about aircrafts. Now it can lead into an SSTO, but we can cover that in another video. This is just basic aircrafts 101. So for those of you who are brand new, welcome. Hopefully you learned something. All right, let's move on. Now there's a lot about aircrafts that of course we can't really cover in just one video. So we're just gonna cover the basics. Okay, so the first thing you need to know about building a plane is what parts to pick when building it. Right now we're just going to go for a very simple plane. So I'm going to go over the very basics of cockpits. Different command pods are meant for different styles of craft. So you have to be careful which one you pick. It should be painfully obvious that something large and bulky and doesn't look like it's aerodynamic at all would be a bad choice for your aircraft. For an aircraft to pierce the thick atmosphere, you want something sharp looking, something aerodynamic looking, something sleek. This would be a good choice, because in KSP, the shape of the aircraft does matter. So since this is going to be a very simple plane, we're going to choose one of these two cockpits. Both cockpits can be aerodynamic and sleek and pierce through the atmosphere just fine. However, we also have to look at their weight. When building an aircraft, weight can be a problem, especially if you start building stuff like cargo aircraft, let alone SSTOs. As you can see, the Mark 1 cockpit weighs 1.186 tons, whereas the Mark 1 inline cockpit only weighs 0.9 tons. It's a small difference, but it can make a big impact overall. So we'll choose the Mark 1 inline cockpit. Now when choosing fuel tanks for your craft, there are many to choose from, but for an air breathing engine aircraft, you're only going to need certain ones. For example, the Mark 1 liquid fuel fuselage holds a lot of liquid fuel, which is perfect for our aircraft. It doesn't have any oxidizer, which our aircraft will not burn, and so therefore it'll just become dead weight. Also, in the aerodynamics tab, there are parts which contain both air intake and liquid fuel, so also consider those while you're building your aircraft. However, for this tutorial, we're also going to be going over air intakes. So the Mark 1 liquid fuel fuselage is good for this tutorial. Now let's talk about engines real quick. In the engines tab, you can see that we have plenty of engines to choose from, but only a few will work for this aircraft. We're not trying to build an SSTO or a large cargo plane, so we only need something fairly simple. It is very important to remember that different engines do different things. For example, the Weasley turbofan only works at low altitudes. Once you start getting higher, you start losing power. Then you have the Panther that can operate in a higher altitude at faster speeds and even has an afterburning mode to make it go a little faster. Not to mention that it also comes with a gimbal or vectoring. This means it can move the direction of thrust up, left, right, wherever you need it in order to aid in your control. Then you have the Whiplash, which is a very high altitude turbo ramjet engine. It can still work in low altitudes, but unlike the Panther or the Weasley, it's going to still be operational at high altitudes, while the other engines will flame out. And then of course we have our Rapier. This engine is specifically designed for SSTOs. SSTO stands for Single Stage to Orbit, but we'll talk about that in another video. It can operate at extremely high altitudes. It is a combination of jet engines and rockets higher than the Weasley, Panther, or even the Whiplash. All three of these engines will flame out before the Rapier does. This allows you to use as much air in the atmosphere as possible before having to switch over to rockets. So for this very simple plane, we're going to use the Panther. We could have gone for the Weasley, but I like the afterburner. It's pretty. Now for command and control, we're not going to use any of these. When I see someone using advanced inline stabilizers and, or reaction wheels, or even RCS for their planes, I kind of cringe. You shouldn't have to be able to use any of these if you build a stable plane. And I'm going to show you how. Go past your structural. Don't need any of that. Robotics. We're not building a Gundam. Don't worry about coupling. We're not worried about payload right now. However, aerodynamics, that's the next stop. In your aerodynamics, you have a bunch of parts to choose from, wings, nose cones, prop engine, fan blades, but what we want to go over right now is air intakes. Now we're just going to go over the extremely basic air intakes, nothing too advanced for this video. Just like jet engines, some air intakes operate at higher speeds and at higher altitudes than others. 
The circular air intake operates at lower altitudes and at lower speeds. If you try to go any higher, your engines might flame out because they're not going to receive the air that they need. The adjustable ramp air intake is great for extremely high altitudes at extremely high speeds. It operates more efficiently at high altitudes than it does lower altitudes. And then you have the shock cone intake. It's arguably one of the best air intakes the game has to offer. It operates at extreme altitudes and extreme speeds, just like the adjustable ramp air intake. However, it can actually bring in more air into the engines than the adjustable ramp air intake can at those speeds and altitudes. But for this tutorial, we're going to go ahead and use the radial air intake. It's a good low to mid-range air intake. Plus, it allows us to put it on the sides of the craft. This gives us room to put anything else we want on the front. Now, a good rule of thumb is one air intake per jet engine. Now, if you want to get more advanced, then yes, multiple engines can be placed on a single air intake. But we'll leave that for another video. Now, it is important to remember that multiple air intakes for a single engine can actually hinder the overall performance of the aircraft. The engine only needs so much air to operate. If you give it too many air intakes, it's only going to use half of the potential of both of these air intakes and not the full potential. In other words, to make it simpler, if the jet engine only uses one gallon of air per second and one of these air intakes give it one gallon of air per second, that's two gallons of air per second. However, it's only using one gallon of air per second. It can only use one gallon of air per second no matter how hard it burns. So technically, out of these two air intakes, it'd be only using 0.5 gallons of air per second. So you see, what you've effectively done is you put on dead weight basically, as the engine will never fully use the potential of either air intakes. By taking the second air intake away, you've lowered the mass of the craft as well as the drag. Now the jet engine that uses about a gallon of air per second is receiving a gallon of air per second from the one air intake. So hopefully I delivered this in a way that you can understand. If not, I apologize. Now another good rule of thumb is to match your air intake with the appropriate engine. For a small craft, an adjustable ramp air intake is excellent for a rapier engine. They both operate at high altitudes and extreme speeds. However, this setup is only good for a light aircraft. If your aircraft was any heavier, then a shock cone would be recommended for your multiple rapier engines. This, however, goes into the advanced portion that we're not covering in this video right now. Just remember to match up the appropriate air intake for the appropriate engine. Something like this with a circular air intake and a rapier engine would not be very efficient at all, as a rapier engine would demand more air from a higher altitude that the circular intake could not deliver. In other words, you'll flame out at a very low altitude. It also works both ways. If you were to use a Weasley engine that's operating only at low speeds and low altitude, and throw on an adjustable ramp air intake which is meant for high altitude at high extreme speeds, then the overall efficiency and performance of the craft is going to be handicapped. Now I can go into a whole nother video explaining why, but for the basic, basic, basics of knowledge, this sucker is heavy, okay? Slapping on a circular air intake will greatly reduce the weight and drag of that craft. Fun little history lesson, back in the day, you could slap on a ton of air intakes for one engine. This was called air hogging. Air was considered more like a resource in the game's engine. That meant even if you were at 50,000 meters high and each air intake was receiving 0.01 amount of air, the fact that you had like a hundred of them on there meant that the engine was still receiving enough air to operate at extreme, extreme altitudes. You could virtually almost go into orbit with just the jet engine. However, they've recently fixed this bug, so it no longer applies. Drag can kill an aircraft faster than, well, pretty fast. And wings create drag. They also create lift, but they also create drag. So depending on what you want the aircraft to do will depend on how many wings you give it or how large those wings are. If you're just interested in carrying stuff from point A to point B, then you want a lot of lift. So you're going to have a lot of wings or a lot of relative wing area. Now having a lot of wings means that your craft is going to have a lot of drag. But if you're just a big cargo plane that flies at low altitudes, then that's no problem. For example, SSTOs use as little wings as possible, but that's an advanced category and for another video. So with this craft, we don't really care about either, but we just want it to fly really well. So we don't want a whole lot of wing space, but at the same time, it's okay if we have a little bit of wing space. Wing area. Good gosh. Now to help with drag, nose cones are great. The one I'm going to use is 
This one, the aerodynamic nose cone. Now I could use the advanced nose cone because it's sharper looking, but here's the thing. The advanced nose cone is actually heavier than the aerodynamic nose cone. So even though the advanced nose cone is great for flying in the low, thick atmosphere, it loses its efficiency the higher up you go in comparison to the lighter aerodynamic nose cone. Wings create drag, surfaces create drag, such as air intakes create drag, things of this nature. You don't, you don't want too much drag or things popping out from a smooth aerodynamic surface, basically. If you have too much drag, then you lose a lot of efficiency. Efficiency meaning fuel consumption and speed. Control. Now, a lot of people like to put on like a butt ton of advanced inline stabilizers or reaction wheels in order to control their craft. You, If you have to use inline stabilizers to control your craft, then there's something wrong with your initial control. Let's forget all about this. I'm going to teach you how to do this without all these extra control things that people like to slap onto their crafts. Just like in real life, airplanes are controlled with the elevons. Am I saying that right? I feel like I'm not saying that right. You know, these things, the ones that go up and down. But regardless, these control surfaces are on the far tips of the wing. You get more control when the elevons are at their wing tips compared to if you have if you see an elevon close to the center of the wing. This gives you less control. More control? Less control. Now of course doing something like this is considered a flying wing in which case the wings would not be straight like this. They would actually have a dihedral design basically like this. This would give you some stability when it comes to yaw. Not a whole lot though. So you'd have to be very careful. So why is a dihedral wing better than a flat wing? In a dihedral design, the wings are lifting up and inwards towards the body, creating stability, whereas a flat wing design is simply lifting up. Flying wings can be a little bit tricky. It's a little bit more advanced than what I'm willing to do on this 101 series. Now, building a tail is as simple as building a wing, but for a craft this small, we can use something simple like a winglet on the wing like so. This will do fine. Even looks kind of nice. Landing gears. A lot of people have trouble with landing gears. That's okay, when I first started I had a bunch of trouble too. The placement of the landing gears all depends on where your center of mass is. Right now our wings are just a little too high, so I'm going to click on the tool move, or number two on your keyboard. I'm going to click on the wings. You can use the F key to switch between local, which is the parts orientation, or absolute, which is the orientation of the hanger. In this case, we'll go absolute. We're going to hold down shift as we click on the green arrow and bring it down, and then I'm going to hold down shift and click on the red arrow and bring it in. This will bring our wings closer to the belly, kind of like an actual aircraft. Now, since we used the toggle snap feature, let's pick the small one, small landing gears, because it's a small craft, and place them on the wings. Now, notice that the wheels are off just a bit. Having wheels off like this is bad, because it means that your craft is going to want to go one way or the other when you're trying to take off. But the wings are perfectly aligned to a preset angle, which means that if I was to hold down shift again and click on the wings, making sure that my rotate tool was on, I could just hold it down hold down shift and pull on this green line and pow these are straight now what that means is that all I have to do is click on the landing gears and do the same thing but bring them down just a pinch now our landing gears are perfectly straight now notice where I place our back landing gears from where the wheel is the wheel is just a little bit behind the center of mass and there's a reason for this when you're taking off you're moving forward view your aircraft as a seesaw. It can fall down like this, or it can pull up like this. This is good when you want to take off because of the fact that if you're trying to pull up, there's room for your rear to go down, allowing your nose to pull up. But for example, if these landing gears say were in the very far back like this, your aircraft would have a tough time trying to pull up because now that seesaw effect is completely gone. So as you're trying to pull up, the back end of the craft is trying to go down, but it can't go down. Your landing gears are in the way. The dreaded center of lift versus center of mass. Now as you can see here, we've already got it where the center of lift is behind the center of mass, which is what you want. You don't want it too far away because this will indicate that the center of mass is so far forward that the center of lift can't lift it up. In other words, your aircraft is nose heavy and you don't want the center of lift too far front because this will indicate that your aircraft is rear heavy. In a rear heavy aircraft, the lift and the drag is so strong in the front that it wants to flip over with the heavy end facing front. The best way to imagine this kind of setup is to think about it like a dart. The head of the dart is of course very heavy, while the tail end is light and has wings or control surfaces. This of course creates drag, which pulls behind the center of mass that's on the dart. 
keeping it straight and narrow. Try throwing a dart backwards. You'll see what happens. The tail end of the dart will catch the atmosphere and drag itself back behind the center of mass. Having the center of lift and the center of mass directly on top of one another creates very unstable forces. Now you can use these highly unstable forces to create a type of trick plane or highly maneuverable fighter jet, but that should be in another video. Right now we're just worried about basic stability, so it's not going to be too far back or too far inward. So let's get this thing ready for flight. We're going to go into it. Which is kind of like going to action groups. Blech. We're going to make our custom number one key. Click on our Panther. And we're going to turn it into toggle engine. Toggle engine off and on. Next, custom two key. We're going to toggle. We're going to toggle mode or switch mode. Panthers have two modes. They have wet and dry. So basically afterburner versus no afterburner. All right, let's make this thing fly. Now every cockpit, of course, has its own type of little reaction wheel inside of it. So to prove the point that we're not using any reaction wheels, we're going to go ahead and turn it off. Moving pretty straight. Let's go ahead and hit the S key and pull up. There we go. Hey. <laughs> Hit the G key, bring in those gears, and there you are. We're about half power right now. See how, whoa. Nice, not bad. It's got a decent turn to it. Now remember, we're not trying to build an ultra maneuverable jet fighter, in which case, that would be in another, that'd be in another video. Oh boy, we're overheating hard. I think we're gonna lose our engine. Ah, we lost our engine. <laughs> ah, that was fun. Well everyone, thank you so much for watching and thank you so much for being a part of this channel. I hope you liked this very extremely, extremely simple how to build a plane tutorial. So for anyone out there who's had problems doing this, you're welcome. For everyone out there who already knew about this, but enjoyed the video anyway, then thank you. Again, thank you so much for watching. I am Veos, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye bye you know, if you've made it this far to the video, then you should really consider clicking that button on the bottom left. I mean, you should really, 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 really consider it. I'm, I'm just saying, you know, it's, it's, it's awfully pretty. Yeah, I, I would click it. I would. I would definitely click it. Bleh.